Hey everybody, Renee Diversal here. Super excited to be at Summerlin Hospital with a couple of awesome Valley Health System general surgery residents. And we just were talking pocus. For this Educast, we decided to go a little bit different. It's not live because we are all so fired up for our big announcement you're gonna have seen from yesterday by the time the Educast airs that we wanted to record some some eps, some intros in person. So I'm sitting here in Nevada with Dr. Wolfgang Gillier, who is the Dean of Toro University, Nevada, College of Osteopathic Medicine. I got it, it's a mouthful, but we're very excited about the Toro and Vave partnership. And so just wanted to feature them on our Educast, which happened to be about medical education. Wonderful, and actually we are still excited about uh, the entire process. And this is something that uh, if you look at it, uh, technology has advanced, medical healthcare has advanced, but medical education has still kind of lagged behind. And now we are ready to go into the technology driving this forward and ultrasound will be the centerpiece. Ultrasound will be the one that gives direct patient care so that we, we know that the surgery or the manipulation part is a direct access to the patient. Now we have a third way of directly interacting with the patient and the richness of ultrasound we are just starting to chip away of what we can learn. So what a wonderful opportunity. I wish you good luck, enjoy it. And everyone who's using these probes and ultrasound, I wish you just the best learning there is. Go forward. I'm gonna have them all introduce themselves and then we're gonna introduce my amazing next speaker. Hi, I'm Kelly. Hi, I'm Rachel. And I'm Colton. So first up speaking, we have Christine Schutzer, our educational sonographer and assistant program director for point of care ultrasound at OHSU. She is an incredible educator and has taken our program to the next level. COVID hit, we had to change a lot of things really rapidly and she did a phenomenal job. And so I'm really excited for her to share her experiences with you about turning our clinical ultrasound elective into a virtual cognitive focus elective. Thanks so much, Renee, for having me, you and the Dave team. I am the assistant program director for the point of care ultrasound department at Oregon Health and Science University. And just like the rest of the world, we had to go online because of COVID back in March. So they asked our program if we could do an online version of our elective. We have adapted this over many months. We've put about 200 students, um, PA students and medical students through. We had to really think about how we were going to do point of care ultrasound online. So how are we going to make that transition? And so this hands-on skills in an online world, how do we do that? How do we have a meaningful elective for our students that we weren't just filling time for them, that they actually, we were value added and they got a lot out of our education that we were offering them. So when we looked at this, we, the first thing we had to talk about is what are we losing? Um, and honestly, the scariest part was that we lose all the fun. We're kind of the the party of the medical school. We get these great cameras that get to look into their bodies. So losing that was a little bit nerve wracking. Would we be able to deliver a really effective elective for our medical students without that? We don't have that experiential learning piece that we had before where we could stand at the bedside and really walk them through it and they could practice. Um, those in-person demonstrations, we didn't have that anymore. So we had to come up with a way to develop an elective that we could meet all of the things that they needed for this elective. So we looked at the, the three pillars of point of care ultrasound, and that is the acquisition, interpretation, and integration. We wanted to address each one of these and how could we effectively deliver these three pillars? So the first one and the most easy to deliver, most of us do it all the time through image review and whatever we're doing is um, the interpretation piece. So we, but we didn't want to do the same thing all the time and we didn't want to, I think there's a tendency to just deliver lectures and lecture at the students when you're in this um, online world. I can't assume too much. So we would put something like this. This is a left upper quadrant of the spleen. And we would put this up and the students need to either speak up or put in the chat box, which is usually easier in the chat box, um, what exactly they're seeing. And I want them to interpret the image. And is it positive fast exam? Is it negative fast exam? What exactly are we looking at? But then we go through step by step and we talk about, okay, what is this structure? And they have to type in the chat box. 
what is this structure? They type it in the chat box. And where, what are we looking at here? So that I know we're all looking at the same exact thing and they're interpreting it correctly. So that interpretation, we do a lot of pathology. It's very interactive. At the end of these, um, we, we come like a pathology image review. We do these really fun online quiz platforms. And so on that online platform, we can actually answer together each individual question. I can see how many of them got it right, how many of them got it wrong. And then we can pull up the clip and the question and discuss um, what some of them thought was the correct answer and why it wasn't the correct answer and we can interpret. And so I don't really use that quizzing platform for grading as much as just formative feedback. So I know that they're actually what they're getting back from from what we're teaching and that it's um, it's all sinking in on the level that we want it to sink in. So the next part of the three pillars of POCUS is integration. So this is a little bit harder, but they do a near peer, peer teaching project, which I highly recommend. I feel like they take away so much more from those near peer teaching experiences. When they're teaching somebody else, they really feel like they have they do have to know that they have to be able to answer questions. And so that really brings home and, and they get to choose the topic. So it's an area that's interesting to them. They have to answer some sort of clinical question with this and then go through and then engage in discussions with their peers at the end of their near peer session. And then we have this amazing case-based learning module that we have done with one of our medical students that with the help of um, Dr. Pyro and Dr. Diversdahl. And it's just this amazing, they present cases, the students engage in differential diagnosis, they put up all the possibles on a grid, then highlight all of the pathology on the video so they saw clips. And that's how we bring in that clinical integration. When to use it? What are your limitations? How, how does this help um, in our physical diagnosis in our daily, their daily care. So usually we'll have one of the physicians that's in on those sessions to really bring home that clinical integration. So the last piece of the puzzle for us is acquisition. And that is definitely a harder nut to crack. And we even thought, can we address acquisition um, without being able to have hands-on probes for, for the present time? So, and we actually came up with some great ways to deal with acquisition. So we lost a lot in the process, but I feel like we gained a lot too. And so we're able to go back to the fundamentals. We have a lot of time that we're, we're trying to fill where they're not doing hands-on, but I really believe in going back to the absolute basics and task deconstruction. And for, for ultrasound task deconstruction and those cardinal movements, we talk about what the beam trajectory through the body, so they really understand where that slice is. Instead of just looking at it on the screen, they're really understanding exactly how they're obtaining that image and why we can see fluid, why fluid collects there in those particular areas. So going back to the basics and for task deconstruction, you're gonna divide these psychomotor skills you're trying to teach down into these smaller micro skills. And for ultrasound, the, those micro skills are our five cardinal movements. So the sliding, the rocking, the fanning, rotating and compressing. We want to go beyond just teaching them this is the motion. This is what you do. When I say sliding, this is what I want you to do. I want them to understand exactly what each of these motions, how it's changing their image so that when they are stuck and they are scanning on their own or even looking at an, um, an image for image review, that they're able to know which motion will help them correct that image. Um, we teach them isolating their movement. So they're only doing one movement at a time. And even though they can't do these motions, we talk about these motions during image review. And if they know that rocking moves things left to right on their screen or changes their angle of incination, they can actually help better understand how they would optimize the image. So just for an example, we go through, we talk about rocking. We talk about what the motion is. We then show the video of what the motion is and exactly what we're doing in the body. And then we, we talk about the image itself. So in that plane, in the sagittal plane, we are able to take the aorta from an angle 
to level across horizontally on our screen. We're changing that angle of insonation. So now they understand if they want a better image and they want to change the angle of insonation or level something out across the screen, then rocking is the technique that they're gonna use to do that. And then we go to the short axis view and we talk about that same aorta and we highlight the aorta and then talk about how that now is moving that aorta left to right. So now we've talked about they can change their angle of insonation with rocking and they can also move the center things on the screen or move it left to right across the screen. So when they're later doing that heart or we see an image during image review of a heart that's kind of off here, the, that apical four chamber that always speaking off the side of the screen, how do we get that back? And so they know and uh, now understand that if we rocked that probe back that we would bring that level into the screen and we'd center that on our screen. So we also talk about probe position, where it's going to be, how we're slicing um, through the body. And this is where beam trajectory comes in. And uh, I've developed these um, slides to really explain this in a way that they can understand exactly how that beam is slicing through the body. And so we also talk about indicators. And when we look at this, the screen over and over again, we talk about this, okay, if indicators towards the head are indicators on our screen, on the right side of our screen, then this is everything on this side of the screen is towards the head. Everything on this side of the screen is towards the feet. This is lateral. This is where the probe sits, is skin line. We constantly do that on the images. So there, we're reinforcing that this slice is coming through at a coronal plane in the right upper quadrant. So if I um, take these MRI slices, which they can conceptualize, and I rotate the ultrasound image to match that so they can understand exactly how that's slicing through. And the next few slides just kind of demonstrate how we show um, the relationship between these two. And so we highlight the diaphragm on both images side by side, seeing how that slice is going across, um, that beam is cutting across and how we're getting that image on our screen. And then just two images side by side, and then we flip it back to ultrasound protocol. So now they have a really good concept in their mind about how we're slicing through and how to interpret, find each of the anatomical structures on these images. This slice is actually very, very helpful to, to the students. Um, we talk about how they're standing at the foot of the bed. This is an axial slice through the body and looking up at our patient that's cut in half right at the level of the kidneys. And we can now talk about that beam trajectory that's coming across first through the skin, then through the muscle, then through the ribs, liver, Morrison's pouch, kidney to the spine. And they can see that we're slightly posterior in this, in this view and then adding in the fluid so they can see why we look at Morrison's pouch when we're looking for fluid in our supine patient. So we, we definitely lost something during this transition, but I think we gained quite a bit too. So we got that time to work on the fundamentals because we're not in the lab trying to scan. Um, the challenges for us as educators is that we, we have to become more engaging. If we want them to actually enjoy it, especially if we're doing it two-week elective, we've got to raise the bar from just lecturing at them that whole time. It's pushed us for more learning, um, innovative learning experiences. I know it has for me as an instructor. How do we keep these students engaged? Another thing is we don't have any limitations on space. So for our takeaways, I would say we really wanted to do a variety of learning experiences. We engage them with an image review. We engage them with um, inquiry-based learning, formative quizzing. We in engage in case-based learning. So it's not just the same thing every day. We really try to make those um, lectures engaging where they have, to, they have to answer and interpret while we're there live. We have a combination of asynchronous learning and synchronous learning. So a lot of the elective, they can do modules online and then the other part of the elective, we meet all together at a specific time, and that's when we engage in those really interactive. Um, and, and the students really appreciate the combination of both. They get the faculty expertise, but they can also kind of learn on their own. And then those interactive quiz pl platforms, I, I find as an educator, really, because at the end of the day, when you say, OK, do you have any questions? majority of the time it's crickets. You just sit there and they're like, no, we're good. But then when they try to do the quiz, 
you find out that things that you may have just told them they're missing still because they didn't make that connection. Thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to share our experiences at Oregon Health Sciences. Okay, so I'm back and this time I'm here with three Toro University Nevada DO students. We are all super fired up about their new probes. So we're gonna go around the horn, say their names and we're gonna introduce our next speaker. Hello, my name is Terrence. I'm Hannah. And I'm Abby. Awesome. So next up, we have Dr. Rob Ferry, who's a phenomenal point of care ultrasound educator. He's the chief of point of care ultrasound at Indiana University. And he also is the director of the IUSM point of care ultrasound initiative. And so I'm excited to have him tell you about how they adapted their in-person scanning for COVID. Well, thank you, Renee, for having me. So I'm going to talk about uh, what we did at Indiana University School of Medicine to continue our point of care ultrasound curriculum despite COVID. And so we reimagined this, uh, how we do hands-on instruction so that we could actually still continue to provide it. So some things to first understand about IU School of Medicine. So we're big, like really big. We have 1,400 students spread across nine different campuses across the state. And so trying to put some type of hands-on instruction or model or teaching um, modality that's different is really challenging in this type of a system. But we needed to do it because of the problems we were running into with the pandemic. So just a little story, our point of care ultrasound story starts in academic year 2018-19, where we put together a, a curriculum that was a four-year curriculum. So students had significant point of care ultrasound didactic and hands-on experience in each of their years of medical school. Last academic year, we started implementation, and this year we were planning to continue that implementation. And so if you look at sort of our longitudinal model, we had uh, a staged implementation. We weren't gonna begin this all at once, but we were gonna stage this over several years. And unfortunately, the pandemic create a, a huge problem in how we were going to stage this. But we didn't want to lose traction and we didn't want to lose ground. <clears throat> so in reimagining how we were going to do this, these are some things that we thought of. So to get the, to sort of get the background, I think we do hands-on instruction here like everyone does hands-on instruction, right? Generally we have a model, we have an instructor, and then we have some students around that instructor. And so this is a typical room scenario. We've got a 30 by 30 classroom and we, you know, stack five to six stations. I mean, it's just crowded, right? But you can't do that in COVID. I mean, we need to be socially distanced. So now, you know, we have, uh, we have limitations on how many people we can have in a room anyway. And so we, were, we needed to rethink how we did this. So instead of having, you know, five students surrounding a model with an instructor, all in close quarters, with, you know, you imagine that in a big campus like ours, we have to put several people in a room. It is just, it is not possible to use that same model with our current pandemic. So we began thinking of different ways that we could do this hands-on instruction. And so basically <clears throat> we thought of how do we continue to do this, not create, um, a loss of, of a full year without hands-on instruction, but still continue to do. So we, we thought of this, uh, several different ideas, but the basic idea was a progressive dinner style event. The Indianapolis campus houses about half of the students every year. So we have 170 students every year. And how were we gonna pull this off in the, the, the curricular time that we were allotted in the, in the space that we have Essentially what we did is we needed to find a different approach and a place. So the place that we found was a, a, an old clinic space that had eight or nine rooms um, that would allow us to do something in a socially distanced way. And the method by which we decided to do this is this progressive dinner style event. So essentially students would sort of file single, almost like in a single line and like they were on a conveyor belt 
and essentially go from one station to the next, to the next, to the next. We had to scale down what we thought was our bare bones minimum that we needed for hands-on instruction. So we needed a model, we needed a, an instructor, and then we needed the students. And so essentially what we did is we found this clinic space where we could put these three people into a pretty big room. It, it was about a 15 by 15 foot room. And that was the best that we could think of from a socially distanced way, but it still met and kept within our, in, our school guidelines for what we could do. And so, you know, normally for first year students, they have six labs. And for second year students, they have at least two labs. And so because of the resources we were going to need to pull this off, we decided to do one event where we would have first year students for one event and second year students for another event at the Indianapolis campus. And so the way that we were going to pull this off is that we were going to create an instructional video that they would watch that was about 10 minutes in length. They would watch it immediately standing outside of the clinic door. And then as soon as they finished that, they would go in and do a 10 minute hands-on instruction, uh, hands-on session with the instructor and a model. After they finished that, they would march on to the next room where they would again watch another 10 minute video. And then after that, they would march into the room and do another hands-on, 10 minute hands-on session. And so as you can imagine, we essentially have a very long line of students and they're each at doing something at a station for 10 minutes and then they advance to the next station and then to the next station and then to the next station. So for our second year students, the curriculum is much more clinically focused, the content's more clinically focused. And so we actually had a Sonosim station at the very end, which was a case that they would use the Sonosim and then um, do that case with an instructor and move on. And actually that case was with four students in a much bigger room uh, and space that they did together. And as soon as they finished that, uh, they were done for the day. So what did we need to do to pull this off? So the first thing we needed to do is we needed to collapse, especially the first year curriculum into two hands-on sessions. And so what we did this, uh, what we did is we had to leave out some content, but the majority of the content that we could, we could still do, we just collapsed it into an abdominal exam or into a cardiovascular exam. And we did that for the second year students as well. And so we created these separate 10 minute videos. Some of it was unique, but some took old content that we put together to create this new content. And then we also created some cards that went along with this to be a prompt. And so here's an example of our aorta exam. So these were cards that we sent out to the students before the examination day and that we had available on the examination day that essentially demonstrated the normal anatomy, the things that we were trying to, the views that we were going to be obtaining. And then particularly for our second year students, we used some, um, some pathologic images also with our cards to help them understand um, the clinical component that was part of the curriculum. So what did this actually look like? So basically people signed up for uh, a time which uh, to begin this session. And so every 10 minutes, they would advance to a new station. We had eight clinic rooms, actually we had nine, but we had uh, these different clinic rooms. And so four students showed up at you know, noon and then at 12.10, four more students showed up and then at 12.20, four more students showed up. And essentially they marched through these video hands-on exam, then another video, then another hands-on exam. And then for the first year students, they were then complete. For the second year students, they then went on to do a group Sonosim case, and then they were finished. So what was our feedback? So for the instructors, we were happy because we got it done, but it was hard. I mean, it was about, uh, we actually broke the session, the students up into two separate sessions and each one was about three and a half hours and three and a half hours of repeating the exact same instruction every 10 minutes it was a little tough but the students loved it and the reason why they loved it was because 
a lot of their hands-on in-person instruction has completely gone away. And we were able to put something together that fit within the guidelines that allowed them to do something, and they were extremely happy. We asked some pre and post assessment questions, not a lot, but just to get an understanding and idea of if they like this type of approach. And so uh, what some of the things that we learned, so 91% of the people felt that watching that video before they went into the room to do the hands-on instruction was sufficient. Almost all of them, 98%, felt like that hands-on session significantly improved their ability to do an ultrasound exam. And we actually asked this about the different types of exams we did, but it was, um, I mean, 90% is the average. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they loved it. And then only one person felt uncomfortable with this setup in the midst of the pandemic. Another way to say that is 90, almost all of them, all but one, 99%, thought this, this was great. This worked. I felt that I was safe doing this in the midst of the pandemic. One of the challenges of providing point of care ultrasound education and any type of ultrasound education is the amount of time that you need for the instructor, that the student to instructor ratio. And actually, when we went back and did the math, we were actually able to provide the same amount of hands on time, like hands on probe time per student, if not even a little bit more with this model than with the traditional model. So generally you have five students sitting around a model and they've got 30 minutes, 45 minutes to do the exam. Most of the time they're just sitting there. They're not actually, don't have hands-on probe time. What changed with this is that that entire, almost that entire 10 minutes was a one-on-one -on -one instruction with their hand on the probe. And because we were able to get enough instructors to be there for that time, I think we actually provided a better education than in the traditional, the traditional method. And this is actually a way to, to schedule something, um, several instructors at the same time, and to just crank it out and to get it done. Well, thank you, Renee, and thanks to all of you for listening. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions at the end, and uh, feel free to reach out as well and to um, ask me more. We're also happy to share any of these videos and this content that we created if that will help you as well. Okay, this time I am back with Dr. Saju Joseph, who is the General Residency Program Director here in Vegas at Valley Health System. Fantastic POCUS advocate and basically knows everybody ever. <laughs> I wish. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Joseph knows a ton about POCUS and is going to be really instrumental in this push moving forward here at Toro University. We also have two awesome fourth year Toro University DO students who are going into general surgery. So we want you to look, look out for them on the interview trail. My name is Taylor Pickering and I'm Jonathan Chakrian. Okay, so keep an eye out for them. So my next person I'm super excited to introduce is Dr. Jacob Avila. He is known to almost everybody in the FOMED world for his fantastic work on 5-Minute Sono, Core Ultrasound, the Ultrasound Podcast, and a million other things. He is also the Director of Ultrasound at the University of Kentucky, and he's going to be sharing some of his lessons about online learning with us, and we're excited to hear more. Hello, my name is Jacob Avila, and in this video, I'm going to give you some top pearls for creating asynchronous content, or at least things that I think are important. So the first thing to ask yourself when creating this or thinking about basically doing anything extra is ask yourself, why? Why should I learn this? Why should you consider creating asynchronous content? Or if you already do that, why should you try and make it a little bit better? Even before COVID happened, there was this push towards creating this thing called a flipped classroom. Basically, you create some kind of a didactic or some kind of a worksheet or something like that that your learner is supposed to look at before they go to the class. And then when you arrive at class, then you're just kind of doing workshop-based stuff. 
This is so good for bedside ultrasound because we can send out the video or the PowerPoint or keynote or whatever it is that you use beforehand. And then when you arrive at the day of the workshop, then you can just focus in on the most important thing, which is the hands on scanning. It is the most important. I mean, you can watch videos all day long, but this, as I mentioned, was huge for ultrasound education. It's the way that I liked to teach. And in the area in which we are living in right now, the COVID era, it's even more important because we are having less and less time to have actual in-person instruction. So super important. The second why question you should ask yourself is why should you worry about trying to do this well? Sure, you could use your 10 year old laptop with its 10 year old webcam with its 10 year old microphone that's built in. But remember, your learner is going to be a lot more engaged and is probably going to remember things better if you create quality content. There are three components of creating a good lecture. Now this is online and in person didactic as well. The first thing I want to talk about is the development of the actual visual media that you are going to be sharing. The first step is actually getting ultrasound clips. It's very difficult. I mean, it's doable, but it's very difficult to talk about ultrasound stuff if you're not actually showing ultrasounds. So there are basically two different ways you could do this. You could get it off the internet or get clips off the internet, or you can get your own clips that you get on yourself, on friends, family, and your patients. As far as the internet, there are a lot of places that you can look for. The POCUS Atlas is a great website. They have most normals and most pathologies on there. There is also a website which I am uh, the owner of, which is called Core Ultrasound, that we have some clips that are downloadable there, and that's specifically in the Ultrasound of the Week section. And then you can always look on Vimeo or YouTube. There are good things on there as well. Whenever you get things off of the internet, just make sure that you are making sure that there is permission to use the clip in your lectures first off, and then make sure that on each individual clip, even if you get permission, if it's not yours, put the name of the person whose clip it is on there to make sure that you are giving appropriate credit where credit is due. Now let's talk about getting your own clips. There's a little bit of a setup that I have. So I have a thumb drive, a little tiny thumb drive, and then an encrypted solid state drive. The way that I do this is I will get my ultrasound clips, I'll save them, and then I'll stick my USB drive into the ultrasound machine, download them onto the thumb drive. And then on a encrypted computer, I will then put my thumb drive in it and also put in my solid state drive, and then transfer the images to my solid state drive. The thumb drive does not leave work. It stays at work because it isn't encrypted. And then my solid state drive, that's the one that I take with me. It is encrypted because I want to make sure that I don't have any protected patient information just kind of floating around in there. It's got to be safe. If you are using your own clips, it's important to make sure to de-identify them. You want to make sure that there's no patient data anywhere on the clip that you can see. Additionally, the MP4 itself has date information on it and sometimes even has geolocation data on it. It's crazy. So you have to make sure to wipe all of that stuff off of that image. You can do it on applications such as Photoshop, but on coreultrasound.com, Ben Smith has created a amazing tool that is free and open source. Just go to coreultrasound.com, click on tools, and then scroll down to where it says clip de-identifier and then you will go ahead and download it where it says here uh, right over here you're going to go to another website called github and then download either the mac version or the windows version and then when you get the actual program installed you just need to open up the file in which that ultrasound is located and then you need to drag it into this box hit next and then you can change the crop see how here it's the sides are cropped not the top let's say you want to get rid of all the information up top there's no phi on this one but it's just to show you you change the crop you hit okay shows you a preview, and then it will go ahead and create a brand new 
MP4 that gets rid of all of the previous metadata. So this would be a brand new MP4 that was created the day, hour, minute, second that you did it with Clip the identifier. And you can use a paid program like Photoshop and basically do the same thing, but it takes a few more steps. Those other programs also cost money. This is completely free. Now, assuming that you are going to want to do a little bit of education with this online lecture that you're doing, you want to get some background information. You want to know what you're talking about. There are four different places that you can look for information. You can definitely ask somebody else, especially somebody who is maybe an expert in that field. You can use FOMED, which is great. But what I tend to do, especially if I don't really understand a topic very well, is to look through textbooks, and look through PubMed. It takes a little bit of an extra time, but, but here's the thing. There are a finite number of topics within point of care ultrasound, right? So let's say that you want to do a bedside cardiac ultrasound lecture, you're going to spend a couple of days looking up all the nuances of it in textbooks, maybe looking up the most recent data. And then now you have a basic cardiac lecture. And then every, I don't know, year or two or so, then you can catch up on the literature and make sure that your presentation is updated. So it's a little bit of a higher investment initially. But this is the way that you create a really stellar lecture. So that was the development of basically the meat to put into the sandwich that is a lecture. Now let's talk about how to make that sandwich look good, how to make it taste even better, putting good condiments, maybe a little bit of lettuce, some bacon, maybe if you're into that stuff, veggie bacon, vegan bacon, just whatever you want to put in a sandwich. This is the design part when you're thinking about producing your presentation. There's a lot of different software that you can use to actually create your presentation. I will tell you that my favorite one to use is Keynote, which is available only for Apple computers. PowerPoint works equally well. I just think that Keynote is a little bit easier to use. Now, when creating your slides, this is something that seriously, I could spend like a two day conference just talking about the nuances of a slide design. Shout out to Haney Malamet. He's the guy who kind of set me along the path of good slide design. There's basically three rules of thumb to keep in mind. Each slide needs to be simple, visually pleasing, and is there to supplement your voice and your information and your knowledge. It's not there to replace you. It's there to supplement you. This is an example of a very bad slide. There are so many words on this slide. It's very confusing. You can barely read it. Here's the thing. People cannot read a slide and listen to you talk. They either can read the slide or they can listen to you talk. So what you want to do actually is just put an image or a clip on there and then just talk over the stuff. And then if you want to make sure they understand some key points, then just put a few key points on a slide. Try to keep the amount of words on your slide as little as possible. If you can have one word, if you can have maybe two, maybe three words, even better. But you definitely don't want to have full sentences unless maybe it's an actual quote. As far as moving pictures, I see this sometimes with ultrasounds where people will put multiple different ultrasounds like six, nine, 10 ultrasounds on the same screen. It's very difficult for people to know what to focus on very easy for people to get distracted, put one thing on the slide at a time. I think I know why people do this. Sometimes there's a comprehensive kind of idea that they're trying to present. And I'm using this slide here to explain how you can do that. So let's say there's a concept that to you makes sense to all put on one slide. What you should do instead is break up the component parts into three different slides. So instead of having one slide with three things on it, have three slides with one thing on it. The one question that I had once when giving a lecture is somebody mentioned, how do you do algorithms. So here is an algorithm on um, how to look for pneumothorax. This is not mine. This is actually from Matt Dawson. And what you can do is you can present the algorithm like this, but you can use a uh, black box, um, just like a black shape box on your keynote or PowerPoint, and just cover up what you don't want people to see. So when I am talking through a lecture, I will only reveal what part I'm talking about 
after I've talked about it. So I will talk about this algorithm and say the first part is ask yourself if there is sliding or if there was no sliding. And then the next part, if there if there is lung sliding, then there's no pneumothorax. And if there's not, then you look for B lines. Ask yourself, yes, B lines, no B lines. If you see B lines, no pneumothorax. If you don't see one, look for a lung point. And you see when you present it this way, the audience, your learner will be able to follow along with you and make sure that you are adequately communicating with them. And lastly, let's talk about delivery. There are definitely two different ways you can deliver this. You can do this in person, um, but we already talked about that's less common now, or you can do it online. Let's focus in on online lectures. With regards to online teaching, you can use a micro vlogging platform. So that's things like Instagram, Twitter, maybe Snapchat, maybe even this app called TikTok. But let's talk about using your knowledge to actually create a lecture, an online didactic. There are three bits of software you need a computer, of course, to record it. You need a microphone to make sure your voice sounds good and not all grainy and stuff. And then some software to capture the presentation, to record it basically, and then to edit it later. As far as microphones, there are plenty of USB microphones that work very well. Starting from left to right, I have the Rode Podcaster, which is the most expensive and the highest quality. The Blue Yeti in the center, which is a very good microphone as well. And then a Blue Raspberry, which is an exceedingly portable version. A lot of people start off with a Blue Yeti, and I think it works really well. For screen capture software, you can use QuickTime, although it's very difficult, if not impossible, to edit via QuickTime. That's the logo on the left. What I use is the logo in the center, which is an application called ScreenFlow, but many other people use an application called Camtasia. ScreenFlow and Camtasia both will record and give you editing capabilities. As far as distribution, the last step after you've recorded it and everything, I would suggest uploading it to YouTube or Vimeo. They are great places to upload. Basic accounts are free. This is, my goodness, such a eagle eye, maybe like satellite eye view onto what is possible and a few tips on creating good online presentations. If you have any other questions, thoughts, just email me. The email is ultrasoundpodcast at gmail.com or you can reach me via Twitter at Core Ultrasound. Hello, everybody. We are now ready for question and answer time. So we have our four guests here, our four awesome speakers. We already heard from Chrissy, Rob, and Jacob. And uh, we're kind of on these narrow slices here, so we'll have to kind of adjust a little bit. Uh, but I just wanted to um, go through and and ask a couple of questions, um, at least one for each of you. And for anybody watching, it sounds like Twitter's having some issues today. So uh, anybody watching on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, our, our website or anything else, feel free to submit questions for us as well. So um, Chrissy, the first one's for you. I wanted to hear, um, you talked about ways to try to actually transmit ultrasound image acquisition skill without ever having had them touch a probe. Do you have any evidence of or anecdotes about did it actually work? Oh, and Chrissy, let me unmute you. See, I knew, there we go. Perfect. Uh, those are more limited um, opportunities, but some of our students actually came right off of our cognitive elective and then went into clinical rotations. Um, and one, uh, one student in particular, because we get so proud when, <laughs> when they send us back, like they when they loved it, they'll email us back later. And so he wrote us um, from our, our team in the emergency room, who we, we know very well, that they were very impressed with his ultrasound skills. And it really made us think um, he was excited about that because he had a lot of knowledge already going in. And it really made us think about whether or not we can... Um, if it is helpful to to diminish the po the cognitive preload so that they're they're only focusing on acquisition and not all the other things they already know how to interpret the image they already know what they're looking at can does that is it helpful to them when all they're doing is trying to work on the skills themselves so yeah we we've had and they 
the students, we've had a lot of positive feedback from the students um, in our surveys about how much they really enjoyed it and learned a lot and, and had a lot of value added to their education. So totally. Yeah. I think it's a great, uh, excellent future research direction putting on my academic hat. Um, <laughs> so moving ahead to Rob, I wanted to know uh, what you all did was amazing. I mean, I have way fewer students and I still couldn't get them into my Sim Center or clinic. So I think one thing, uh, who did you go to leadership wise to try to figure out where you could get that, find that space, use that space? And if, if that's a IU specific question, I guess the other thing would just be like, one pearl, if you could go back and say, Rob, this is going to help you save a lot of time. <laughs> what would you, what would you share with us? Yeah. So great question. So, um, the school of medicine put out some guidelines that were in accordance with Indiana university. And that included how many people could be in a room and the social distancing guidelines. So fortunately we were able to do some instruction. Finding a space was tough. Um, but we had happened onto this space because it was actually used for their physical exam skills training. And so this was already a known space and, um, I'd actually seen it, uh, about six months prior to this. And so, you know, I, you know, space is a premium, premium at any type of medical school. Anyway. But the great thing about this is that this is a clinic space that is just empty. And, um, and so I, you know, I, I think there's always a space somewhere <laughs> that you can probably find. Um, but fortunately we had already known about the space, not that we were planning on doing anything ultrasound related in that space, but we'd already known about it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Space is a huge premium for us built up on the hill. We're like constantly fighting for it. So, um, okay. Well, thank you to, let's see here, Jeremy Webb, shout out to you via Facebook. He asked, how are you all using portable ultrasound devices with education? And uh, we have the illustrious Dr. Jacob Avila just sitting over there. So we're, we're going to bring you in for this one, Jacob. Sweet. Um, yeah. So, um, we are using, we have multiple different um, ultrasound devices to use. The last workshop that I used, um, and I don't know if you've uh, already kind of mentioned this before, um, Renee, but there's this um, uh, Vavecast um, that works really well because we can actually have um, maybe myself scanning or a student scanning. Um, and then um, all other, you can have whatever, six, seven other people with their own Apple devices spread out and able to look at the exact same images because the um, uh, transducer itself um, creates like a signal so that can send it to like multiple devices. Um, so we're, we found, and I use it with one workshop so far, um, I found that it actually, um, the Vave transducer works very well um, in the educational setting and of course um, in an actual clinical setting as well. Awesome. And and that was a real question. I didn't make up that name from Facebook. <laughs> that was a real question. Um, I believe you. And we uh, just announced yesterday, again, at the intro, in case you missed that, we did everything initially was recorded because I was down in Nevada as we just paired, partnered with um, Tor University in Nevada, the DO school. And so we were able to do a chalk talk with five, you know, five minutes with two students and then have them cast to each other, pass the probe across and get some great fast images and like just like that. So um I think, um, Rob, have you, you've used a variety of other ones in your site and we're going, um, for everybody, just the audience. I know I promised like 43, 45, we're going to do two more minutes of questions. So Rob, just curious if you have any, you know, again, regardless of if it's like, what would you say are some of the, the, I shouldn't say the, the limitations, like what have you found to be, um, very useful in your, in your setting? Oh, and you are muted now as well. All right. So I think that there are some big barriers that you have to overcome to really having a curriculum in the educational space. And one of those is a financial barrier. And so cart-based equipment is just really expensive. And so handhelds fill that space really well. And so I think for you know undergraduate medical education specifically, What's nice is that they're very portable. You can store them. They're, they can be stored in a secure location. I mean, we have 
uh, 60 probes stored in a locked cabinet with a, with a tablet that's associated with them. And so we know where they are, they're secured, they're inventoried, and so I think it helps a lot. For the GME side of things, I think when you start talking about providing education outside of a place that is geographically defined, so you know the emergency department is geographically defined, but the hospital is not. So if you're a, an internist, a hospitalist, or you're a family physician where you're in the clinic and you're in the hospital, handhelds fill that space and that void. Um, and they fill it really nicely. Yeah, so I'm gonna add uh, the last thing, which is that uh, Dr. David Tierney and his team at Abbott Northwestern just recently, recently published a study about car and tablet-based um, machines. Sorry, I'm really tired from the last week and I flew back very early this morning. So um, car and tablet-based machines on the units in the hospital versus handhelds for their residents. And they found that the handhelds were used far more and so I think we're kind of accumulating this anecdotal evidence. So, um, okay, any last thoughts? This was excellent. You all crushed it. I learned so much with this, and I know that this is super hugely helpful for the rest of the POCUS med ed world as well. So, okay, cool. We'll let everybody go. Have a great rest of your evening, and uh, we'll, this will be posted. <laughs>